creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. It's a story that if I wrote this story and took it to an editor, he would throw me into the street and he would have every right. The Extraordinary is the day a plane took off and circled the city of Sydney. On board, no pilot, no passengers, no one. The plane was flying itself. I think we probably fell for the trap of Dad's army by saying, people of Sydney, don't panic! And of course, everybody then ran into the street and panicked. It is the place called Lourdes, near the Pyrenees Mountains in France, and the miracle of a young Sicilian girl named Delizia Sirolli. It's something out of the ordinary. This feeling is inexplicable. The Extraordinary is the unexplained link across the globe that followed the death of painter Tom Robbins. Identical happenings at precisely the same time on two continents. It is the day the Partridge family's Shirley Jones learned her father was dead and the telepathy that summoned her husband from kilometers away. At that moment, the door opened and Jack walked in. The Extraordinary is the prearranged message that was to be sent from beyond the grave to actor Maury Fields and his wife Val. And we decided that whoever died first would stop the clocks, wherever they would be, the other one, on their birthday at 12 o'clock. A message that was delivered. Right on 12 o'clock. Strange. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on The Extraordinary. Val and Murray's story is truly fascinating. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. Flicking through the pages of an old newspaper can be quite enlightening. Things come back to mind that have been forgotten. Events that shape the world take on a whole new meaning when looked at in hindsight. And then there are those things that unless they were there in black and white, you'd swear they were the figment of someone's fertile imagination. What you are about to see is true. It happened in 1955. It's a story that if I wrote this story and took it to an editor, he would throw me into the street and he would have every right to. A truly astonishing story, but one that actually happened. An event unique in the history of Australian aviation. It's a story of how one light aircraft caused three hours of panic in the suburbs of Sydney. It all began with a 30-year-old pilot named Anthony Thrower, who'd rented an Oster Archer aircraft from a flying school at Bankstown Airport. It was just before nine on the morning of August the 30th, 1955. Thrower had planned an hour of touch and goes to brush up on his landing technique. But after only one circuit of the aerodrome, the Oster's engine began to splutter and the pilot was forced to land. For Anthony Thrower, it seemed a lucky break. An engine problem had entered his solo flight close to the ground. He was safely back on terra firma, but was determined to be on his way as soon as possible. What happened next? would hold a city spellbound. There was no self-starter on the Oster, so Anthony Thrower had to restart the engine by hand, a bit like cranking an old T-model Ford. That was the easy part. The engine roared back to life. But apparently, the brakes failed. 
And to throw his amazement, the Oster headed off down the airfield. The next thing thrower knew, his aircraft was airborne and there was no one at the controls. His first concern was that the Austin might crash and kill someone, a concern shared by staff in the control tower. As the Austin weaved overhead at low altitude, they issued an alert and evacuated all the airport buildings. Circling over suburban Bankstown, the plane was certainly a safety risk. But after 15 minutes, the crisis took a dramatic turn for the worse. The pilotless Oster Archer headed for the centre of the city of Sydney. Old Eric Bohm said to me so many years ago... My Radio boy, commentator John Pearce was at Station 2GB that morning. He'd been a top gun in the Air Force, and when the first reports came through, he thought the whole... Pull the other one, mate. And he said, read it. And so I did. As the Oster headed over the suburbs of Sydney, Pierce was able to confirm the report, and he began a blow-by-blow -blow description. We were aware that there was reaction, because I think we probably fell for the trap of Dad's army by saying, people of Sydney, don't panic! And of course, everybody then ran into the street and panicked, which is the surest way to do it. Uh, we were aware of that, but not nearly as much as trying to keep ahead of the story and tell people where the aircraft was. And at that stage, we had people phoning us, although we couldn't put calls to air in those days, but people phoning us with observations. Now, they weren't always reliable. They were observing everything from four-engine Qantas aircraft down to the one concerned. But having some knowledge of Sydney and some knowledge of flying, I was able to plot pretty well where it was. It was, in fact, almost over the centre of the city. Down below, police patrolled the streets Fire and ambulance brigades were on red alert. Even fire floats were standing by on Sydney Harbour. And still new information flooded in to Radio 2GB. I do remember one of them, which scared the pets off everybody, was a report that there may be, there may have been a child in the aircraft too. That theory was checked out by a Navy aircraft, which was tracking the Oster's dangerous progress. The verdict on the child was negative. The cockpit seemed to be empty. By now, it was 10 o'clock. The Oster was over the harbourside suburbs, and no one had the faintest idea when or where it might suddenly plunge back to Earth. That was when the Air Force got into the act, and the drama veered perilously close to farce. They sent one of their Wirraways to intercept the runaway. The Oster, meanwhile, was climbing in a tight orbit and was just off the coast. The RAAF Wirraway was armed with a handheld Bren gun, but when it came to fire, a new problem emerged. At 3,000 metres, it was so cold the gunner's hand had frozen to the gun. So, the embarrassed Wirraway crew gave up the chase, and in came an RAAF meteor. Time was running out, and so was luck. Both cannons on the meteor jammed, and the Oster escaped unscathed again. And the Air Force then had to stand back and said, sorry, we can't do it. Which must have been delight to the people down at Nara, who three times already had phoned saying, chaps, let me know when you want me. And they finally called and said, oh boy, you better come up. The Navy boys from Nara who came to the RAAF's rescue that day were Bob Blewett and Peter McNay. On board their Sea Furies, they discovered their mission was to search and destroy. But Peter McNay recalls they weren't immediately told exactly who the enemy was. We knew there was something going. We knew it wasn't um, sort of a war situation because we, we weren't armed with live ammunition. It was just normal ball ammunition which we use for, for, uh, for practice. So, you know, there was, there was something strange which we didn't know. By this stage, the pilotless Oster had been in the air more than two hours and was out over the water. A safer target 
but by no means an easy one. The Sea Fury pilots now knew what their target was and began searching for the renegade plane. Flying out for a few minutes, all of a sudden I, I spotted a, uh, what I thought was the aircraft way out on the horizon. So I, I said to, to Bob in typical Pobby fashion at that stage, tally how arming, and uh, flew off. Then all of a sudden, uh, I heard this plaintive voice saying, please don't shoot, don't shoot. You know, this is a teal aircraft on its way to, to New Zealand. So I <laughs> right. After that near miss, the Sea Furies got a fix on the Oster. And before they went in for the kill, Peter McNay made one last reconnaissance run. He was just a little nervous about that earlier report of a child on board. Because even though I thought, uh, having looked in, there was nobody there, we still weren't quite sure because it was terribly difficult when the Oster is doing, going fairly slowly in a tight right-hand turn and you're doing at least 100 knots, trying to look in through the, the cockpit. So there was a little bit of nervousness there, hoping against hope that <laughs> there wasn't anybody in it. Remember, it was nearly three hours since Anthony Thrower watched in amazement as his unmanned Oster took off. Narrowly missing the control tower, the plane headed for Sydney. First, the RAAF failed to shoot down the intruder when the gunner's hand froze to the trigger. An Air Force meteor abandons its mission when its cannons jam. A passenger jet makes a hurried radio call when it's mistakenly targeted by the pursuers. But finally, the drama reached its climax. I came round again and gave it a short burst, which actually rocked the aircraft slightly and rocked it slightly out of the foot rate for a turn. And uh, Bobby Blurt came in and gave it another burst of about 12, 15 rounds, and it just caught fire and started to spiral down. And uh, it just was sort of went straight into the, into the sea and sank. Peter McNay and Bob Blewett saved the day, but it seemed nothing could save the RAAF's reputation. The Oster went down at 11.42 a.m., almost three hours after takeoff. But the ripples continued in the national parliament long after the runaway sank into the sea. I remember Townley, the minister, he copped it left, right and centre from people who knew and people who didn't. And people who said, why are we spending all this amount of money on defence when we can't shoot down an Oster? It was a very, very good question. The Oster affair terrified Sydney siders. It seemed that only luck had prevented a major disaster. There was the question of national defence. If one unmanned and unarmed light aircraft could give the RAAF's finest a run for their money, what chance did Australia have against a real enemy? And there was one final blow to national pride and prestige. Australians couldn't even claim the two pilots who delivered the coup de grace as local heroes. Bob Blewett and Peter McNay were in fact Englishmen on loan to the Royal Australian Navy. as one of the most famous faces in Australia. Actor, comedian, TV star. His actress wife, Val Jelle, has her own successful career. So it's fair to say the Fields family is pretty worldly. But when it comes to talk of contact with the other side, Maury and Val have some pretty definite views. After all, they believe they've witnessed contact. Bake the toast. Mm. Thanks. Maury Fields and his wife Val have been a team for more than 30 years. They're vaudevillians who've made the transition from stage to screen via shows like The Flying Doctors. Show business brought them together back in 1956. But by then, both of them were theatrical to the tips of their tap shoes. Val's mother was a dancer. 
and as a child, Val too caught the showbiz bug. There was a powerful bond between mother and daughter, a bond which only strengthened as the years passed. It was something which helped them share their deepest feelings about life and death. I don't think it matters if you're um, religious or superstitious, but there are things you wonder about the hereafter. We discussed it, my mother and I, um, not in a morbid fashion, just um, common sense. Why didn't somebody ever come back and tell you how great it was, if it is wonderful, which we all want it to be. And we decided that whoever died first would stop the clocks, wherever they would be, the other one, on their birthday at 12 o'clock. So if my mother died first, she would stop the clocks wherever I was at 12 o'clock. If I died first, wherever she was, I'd somehow stop the clock. And that way, the other one would know that there was somewhere, really. For years after her mother died, Val remembered that pact every birthday. But there was never a sign of any kind. Certainly no clock stopped at 12. Then came a flight back home from Queensland, and maybe a hint of the hereafter. It was only a split second, but it was like the plane wasn't there. And I was somewhere where I had no life, I had no memory, there was no pain, no joy, uh, no friends. No worries, no responsibilities, and uh, it was a feeling as though it was total bliss and purity and uh, so ethereal. And suddenly I was back in the plane, I could hear the motor humming again. And I thought, that's why she hasn't made contact with our secret pact. She had no memory. It, she had no knowledge of life. It's too beautiful there. However, Val had no time to ponder the meaning of that experience. Tragic news awaited her at home. Her father was critically ill and not expected to live. He was past talking or seeing and he was doing that. And I was so close to him, I was whispering in his ear and he mumbled, clouds, clouds. I think Murray heard him. I was standing right beside Val and I heard him say, clouds. And uh, I thought he was just raving on sort of thing because they told us that this was it, but what a strange thing to say, clouds. That week was a turmoil of emotions for Val. Her father's death, his funeral, and her birthday. Murray said, I'm taking her out to lunch at your birthday. We were getting dressed, and I went to put my watch on. I always leave it in a certain place. And when I went to put it on, I couldn't find it. I quickly looked at it. It was up the other end of the mantelpiece, under my father's photograph that's always been there. And the safety chain was broken. Not quite the pact, the sign that Val and her mother agreed to. But in the bedroom, Mori was about to play his role in this drama. Now I'm pretty particular about the the way I lay my stuff out on the desk there. I had the money and a little change drawer and that old change thing, you know, on the table. And my watch is always laid out in front of that. But it had been moved along about seven inches and right in front of Val's photo. And it was done up. Like, you don't take a watch off and then do it up again. Stupid. 
So I called Val in and I said, did you move my watch? And she said, no. I, I hadn't moved it. I hadn't moved it and it was done up in front of my photo. I know he always lays it out. I picked it up to look at it, wondering why it was done up. And I noticed that it stopped. And it had stopped at 12 o'clock. Right on 12 o'clock. Strange. Exactly as mother and daughter had vowed it would be all those years ago. A little late, but Val is convinced it was the sign she'd been waiting for. What did it mean? Did it mean she wasn't in touch all those years because she was waiting for him? Were they together? It never happened again. The clouds or watch is stopping. Very strange. Now, thousands of people from all over the world have gone to the small town of Lourdes at the base of the Pyrenees Mountains in France to look for miracles. And to this day, thousands walk away convinced that they have been cured, that the crippled have been made to walk and the terminally ill given new life. Whether we believe in miracles or not, the story of a young Sicilian girl must make us wonder. She is here in Lourdes again this year. There, in a pilgrimage marching toward the sacred shrine of Lourdes. A face among the multitudes who come to not only seek miraculous cures, but give thanks. Delizia Ciroli has come every year since 1976 when doctors pronounced her death sentence. Today she is recognized as the 65th Miracle of Lourdes. It began when Delizia was 11 years old growing up in the town of Patern at the foot of Mount Etna in Sicily, an average school day in March. When I began to feel pain in my leg, I told my mother, but she thought it was an excuse not to go to school. Delizia woke with pain in her knee. When she stood up, she felt dizzy. It was so difficult to walk, she was late for class. <laughs> she was known as an attentive student, but this day she couldn't concentrate. The pain was growing, and her English teacher sensed something serious. She took the little girl home. The family physician, Dr. Felica, took one look and immediately booked Delizia into Paterne's hospital. Though he feared the worst, Felica ordered x-rays taken at a medical center in nearby Catan. They noticed that there was something that wasn't right. So my mother took me to Catania. We showed the x-rays to Professor Molica. He said that there was a problem, 
and that I should be hospitalized to undergo a biopsy in order to know more precisely what I had. The results were so bad, Delizia's mother kept the news from her daughter and her husband until the last x-rays were done. So they would not be afraid. I lied. I only spoke of the simple analysis. I didn't say anything to my husband. I kept the secret to myself. The death sentence was delivered by Dr. Quintico. La bimba era particularmente defedata, aveva già perso peso, era compromesso tutto lo stato generale. The child was particularly skinny. Her state, in general, was worrisome. The first x-ray exams and the analyses were clear. She had a malignant bone tumor. The doctors left no room for hope. The cancer was so advanced, the only temporary treatment was immediate amputation of Delizia's leg. Temporary because no matter what they did, the little girl would be dead within three months. No, 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 no. Si vuole que se faça la operación. The news hit Delizia's father, Francesco, with devastating impact. Her mother began to fear for his state of mind. Francesco couldn't accept it. Okay. My father said, if my daughter should die, I prefer she die like that. He didn't want to increase my suffering for no reason. There would be no amputation. I was desperate. I prayed in the night, Lord, show me the way, do something for me. I knew that my child was dying and I was helpless. Night after night, Francesco and Delizia's mother said her name in prayer and waited for the inevitable. It was during this period that the school teacher told Mrs. Ciroli of the shrine at Lourdes in France. Though famous to most Catholics the world over, Mrs. Ciroli had never heard it mentioned in the small town of Paterne, Sicily. Somehow the idea caught fire in Delizia's school and in Paterne. Collections were taken, prayer meetings were held. A fever of hope seemed to grip the entire community. Within a week, the journey to find a miracle would become a reality. Though mother and daughter tried to keep their faith up and their hopes in check, something seemed to be happening even during the voyage. They met a nun, Sister Catherine, who became their guide and counselor all the way to Lourdes. And when they finally reached the shrine, the sight of the thousands of believers lifted their spirits beyond all they had expected. They heard story after story of unexplained cures through the centuries, and for five days, Delizia submerged herself in the history and the holy steps of the pilgrimage, praying at the grotto where believers told her the Virgin Mary once appeared to Bernadette Subiru, bathing her skin in the water of the sacred shrine. of their daughter's true condition came back cruelly and instantly to the Cirolus. Within days, their spirits dropped, for all the prayers of the town and the miraculous powers of water from Lourdes, Delizia's condition worsened. Her weight fell to 22 kilograms. We waited for the end. She suffered horribly. A pain so intense that one day she said, Mama, give me a knife, I want to die. One day she felt so bad that she positioned herself in bed like someone who is going to die, straight, stiff. 
She suffered horribly. It was the work of death. Day after day, month after month, Delizia wasted away. And then one morning, without warning, Delizia appeared from her bedroom. Baba! And she no longer felt pain. She got up. She came into the kitchen. But when I saw her, I didn't understand what had happened. In May 1977, 14 months after X-rays had condemned Delizia to death, a new series of X-rays confirmed the tumor had disappeared, without treatment, without medicine. In July 1977, Delizia and her mother were presented to the Lord's medical team dedicated to examining unexplained cures. The mobility is completely normal, and she can move without pain. There is no trace of the lesion she had on her knee. We are doctors and never speak of miracles. We never employ the word miracle. We say that it was a cure of an illness perfectly defined, which had a completely awful prognosis and which healed against all odds. The Lord's Medical Committee's findings were sent to the Archbishop of Catane, who within the Vatican conducted an exhaustive investigation of Delizia Siroli's experience. And in 1989, at a high religious ceremony attended by Delizia, her recovery was officially proclaimed a miracle by the Catholic Church. She is called number 65, and she is back here at Lourdes every year, helping someone pray for number 66. Past, we've told stories of strange happenings involving the departed, signals from beyond the grave, appearances of those long dead in photographs, paintings, and on videotape. Tonight, for the first time, a new dimension to those stories. It involves a strange happening on opposite sides of the world. A shattering experience in Australia. Across the globe, the experience is repeated twice. A coincidence or a farewell from beyond the grave. The day that we took Tom and Margo up to the Hillsville Sanctuary... Lillian O'Donnell now has a family of her own, growing up in the suburbs of Melbourne. But some of her fondest memories are of her own childhood in London. Back then, her neighbours were the artist Tom Robbins and his wife Margot. To young Lillian, Tom Robbins was more than a famous painter and certainly more than just a neighbour. He was sort of like an extended grandfather, if you like. He, he was a lot older than, than Margot. And Tom, Tom was the sort of a person who, who you just felt a very close empathy with. When Lillian married, there was one wedding present she treasured above all others, a Tom Robbins watercolour of the English countryside she loved so much. The painting was very special to me because it's my one souvenir of, of Tom Robbins, I suppose. After Lillian and her husband settled in Australia, she kept contact with Tom and Margot Robbins. The letters and photographs flowed back and forth until December 1989, when Lillian discovered her great friend had cancer. We got a letter back from Margot to say that Tom was too weak to write himself, but that he enjoyed the letter and, you know, write more. So I wrote another letter and I didn't hear anything for a couple of months. Nevertheless, Lillian had her memories and her painting, the Tom Robbins painting, 
which was still hanging on her bedroom wall in February 1990. I went to bed as normal, um, set my clock for the morning, and just out of the blue, at about 20 past two, I heard this huge crash and woke up out of a sound sleep, thinking that the cats had knocked something over. After looking around for some minutes, I found Tom's painting lying on the floor and the glass wasn't shattered. It was, it was intact, which surprised me after traveling such a distance. A terrifying crash. A treasured painting hurled halfway across the room. An unknown force shatters the peace in the dead of night. In Melbourne, Australia, it is 2.20 a.m. On the other side of the world, there's also a frightening crash. Then, another. Two more Tom Robbins paintings go hurtling to the floor. In London, it is 3.20 p.m. Londoners are preparing for another long winter's night. And here in the northern suburb of Islington, at Tom Robbins' home, it was an afternoon his family would never forget. An afternoon they'll never be able to explain. 3.20 that February afternoon in London corresponded exactly with 2.20 a.m. in Melbourne. Strange happenings half a world apart at precisely the same time. My sister wrote us a letter to say that Tom's daughter had a painting fall off her wall at the same time, and um, another painting in Margot's flat apparently fell. So they were quite astounded that the three had happened um, simultaneously. But there's one final link in this global chain of coincidence. Tom Robbins lost his battle with cancer that very day. He died in a London hospital at 3.20 p.m., 2.20 a.m. in Melbourne. When I realized that the painting had come off the wall, I, I just was filled with an overwhelming feeling that Tom was dead and that it was his way of saying goodbye, that somehow across the miles it was the only way that he could tell me that he was gone. You know, a lot of celebrities we interview for this show each week have no idea what we're going to ask them. I'd say half of them think we're going to talk about their latest movie or TV show. The amazing thing is that even without notice, all of them can immediately recall some eerie or unexplained event in their lives. It seems everyone has one. Like longtime Hollywood and Broadway star, Shirley Jones. Has Keith been having problems with a girl lately? We know Shirley as the ever-patient mum in the TV series The Partridge Family, the show that launched the singing career of David Cassidy. But Shirley's illustrious career dates back to the long-running Broadway hit, Oklahoma. When we asked what was the strangest thing that ever happened to her, Shirley immediately remembered a day on tour with her late ex-husband, singer Jack Cassidy. Jack Cassidy and I uh, were in Florida and we were doing our nightclub act around the country. We were touring. He decided this one morning he was going to go to the horse races. And uh, I just didn't fill up to it because we had a show that night. So I said, well, you go ahead, you know, and uh, I'll just stay home and rest. Well, he went off to the horse races. About, oh, I'd say an hour later, the phone rings and uh, my father had died. And, of course, I was, it was very unexpected, and uh, I was very distraught, to say the least. Um, I had no way of reaching Jack, you know, to tell him what had transpired. I didn't know where he was, and it was a horse race, so I figured, you know, there were ten races. Uh, he was gone for the rest of the day. 
At that moment, the door opened and Jack walked in. And I said, why are you here? What made you come back? You know, he had seen one race and he said, for some strange reason, I felt that I had to get back to the hotel. I had to get back. And um, that was truly an incredible, uh, uh, I think, um, story of ESP because, uh, you know, again, I mean, <laughs> there was absolutely no reason for him to come home. There were 10 races and he saw one, you know. So um, he just obviously got whatever was happening inside me, you know. The racetrack incident wasn't the only eerie experience in her life. She also wanted to tell us her ghost story. I'm a firm believer in, in, uh, in the spirits and um, and I think for the most part they're good spirits. You know, my, my feeling about ghosts is that I'd rather have a ghost than a person in the house because <laughs> the ghost can't hurt you, the person might, you know, so. Uh, but this was a very old house in Pound Ridge, New York, and um, it had been transplanted from Maine, uh, board by board, you know, piece by piece, and it was a 17th century house. Jack and I went there to spend one Christmas. We rented it for f about 14 days. It was owned then by a psychiatrist and his wife. The oldest room in the house was downstairs, and then, of course, there was the stairwell, and there were three floors, and the top floor was the nursery, had been the nursery or playroom. We stayed there for the Christmas week, and then Jack had to leave, so there, I was there alone for about a week. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, you know, I started hearing these very strange noises, so loud and so noisy that they would wake me out of a sound sleep on the top floor, like a bouncing ball, like um, a train, a, a toy train, like children's toys, something going on up there. And of course, at first, I thought, oh, there must be an animal up, up there. And I went up and looked, of course, nothing. It just happened just about every night at about 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, um, pretty consistently. And I finally, after looking around and trying to figure it out, I decided, well, this has got to be a, a ghost. It didn't frighten me at all. I, I matter of fact, I sort of became a friend in a way, you know. I thought, oh well, you know, I, and I, I wasn't frightened by it at all, but I just sort of accepted it. And the day I left, I got back into, into New York City, and I got a call from the woman who had leased us the house, and she said, oh, Shirley, I'm so glad you're home safe, she said, because the room, the oldest room, the psychiatrist's office, the moment you left was blown off the house. They had an explosion, and that room, was the room that was blown away. And she said, we can't figure out why it happened, how it happened, or for what reason. Another story from next week. It's about the famous German fighter ace, the Red Baron, and the appearance of a ghost at his grave in France. Good night. See you in the future. Baron von Richthofen was buried on the 25th of April 1918. It looks as if the photograph was taken that very day or shortly thereafter by the fresh flowers that appear on the grave.